Hi, I'm Beth Green, and I am the founder of TheInnerRevolution.org. And I'm here today as Grandma to talk to you about some realities of today's world, especially to talk about why people are so freaked out. Now, have you noticed that people are freaked out? Have you noticed that there's a lot of uh, fear in the field and people are you know, arming themselves and are, you know, everybody is going to carry guns and we're going to get ISIS and all of that. And, you know, I get it. I understand why you're scared. I'm scared too. You know, I don't want to walk to the, uh, around the block and have somebody shoot me, you know. So I get it. I understand the fear. But I really want to sit down with you today and talk about why we are so crazed why we're getting so crazy about this fear, it's kind of even disproportionate to the amount of violence there is. I mean, you look at the amount of gun violence that happens in the country every single day. These terrorist attacks are not even comparing to the amount of violence we're doing to ourselves. And, you know, it's just... But, but there's something very real that's going on, and I want to talk to you about this. Now, I'm going to be telling you a lot of facts and giving you some history. And most of you are going to be squirming in your seats because whoever sit, wanted to sit through a history class, I mean, you know, everybody was looking out the window when they were children saying, oh, do I have to listen to this? So, you know, you may have some of those feelings, but I am begging you to please listen to what I am telling you because we have got to wake up to what is going on in our nation and how crazy we've gotten and why and put it into some kind of proportion. Okay? So, again, I'm not saying you don't have a reason to be afraid, but there's something about our fear that's kind of nuts, and it's because we have always thought that we were invulnerable. We have had this attitude that America can do anything to anybody at any time without retribution. I mean, oh, America, we get to do whatever we want, we can go anywhere in the world. We can drop napalm on other people. We can kill thousands of people anytime, any day. Nobody's ever going to get mad at us. And nobody's ever going to come over here and threaten us because we are America. We are the USA. Now, I want to tell you, it's not just us. It's the whole Western world. Now, before I go on and tell you a little bit about history, so you get what I'm talking about. Because a lot of you don't know shit about your own history. And I'm not kidding. I mean, we are a nation of schools and schools and schools and schools and ignorance and ignorance and ignorance. And I mean, it's ridiculous. You have access to all this information. I'm going to give you facts, right? And you're going to say, no, nah, she's lying. These are fabrications. This couldn't possibly be true. Well, don't believe me, go look it up. And look it up with an open mind. Find out. Hey. Or believe me. Either way, I wouldn't lie. So, you know this affluenza teen? Have you uh, been following that at all? So there's this guy from Texas who killed four people in a drunk driving incident. And he got 10 years probation. Because he's rich, right? <laughs> Rich people never get the same kind of justice that poor people get, that poor white people get, that black people get, that Hispanics get. So now they said that, oh, you can't really hold him accountable, his lawyers, because he's rich. He doesn't know what he's doing. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. People have this sense of entitlement. So think of us as the big affluenza teen. See, we can go, we can kill Millions if we want. And we will never be held accountable because we didn't know the difference. Because we were too rich to know the difference between right and wrong. Now you're sitting there and you're saying, well, I'm not rich. And you are so right. Most of you aren't rich. I'm not rich either. But there's two things I want to tell you about that. Number one is we are rich. You know, we, the United States, I think we have like 4 or 5% of the world population and like 25% of the wealth. So that's a little bit skewed. Now, you're saying, yeah, but I don't have this and I don't have that. But when you look at the rest of the world, yeah, there's very rich people out there in the rest of the world. But 
you look at most people, I mean, you know how many people don't even have clean water, you know, or electricity. You know, most of us, our idea of poor doesn't compare to poverty in other places. We don't even know. And, you know, there's, we're going to be um, interviewing Andrew Morgan, who did this fantastic video on the clothing industry, the garment industry, and about the horrible conditions of the workers around the world. It's like, we would protest you know, if a thousand people were killed in a building because it collapsed, because it was unsafe and people were forced to be in there, there'd be an uproar, somewhat of an uproar at least. But see, this is just like business as usual, the way, you know, the industry works. I mean, it's like, oh, well, what's a thousand people dying in a, <laughs> you know, in a collapsed building when it means that I can get cheap sneakers? So there is a reality here that, in the world, if you look at the world, it's awful out there. I mean, the, depre the, the depressing reality of the world poverty that we don't even want to look at. And that within the country, we have a tremendous amount of inequality of wealth. I know that. I mean, there are people who are just like struggling, struggling, struggling. And then there are people who just don't know what to do with their money. You know, I just don't know which designer bag I should get for Christmas. This is a very sick world. You know, there's people in dire straits, and then there's people who are mentally and emotionally ill because they have just too darn much. But I want to talk about the West, and I want to talk about the U.S., understanding that our businesses have been trying to run the world for a very long time. Now, when I say very long time, I'm going to take you back to 1492. Remember... Christopher Columbus, quote, discovered America, meaning that the Europeans discovered America because the native people were already here. And from that time on, it's been the ascendancy of the West, which was mostly white people. And that has given us the impression that white Westerners should have control over the whole world. Do you know, and I bet you don't, that the Pope divided the world between Spain and Portugal? Spain was supposed to take most of Latin America, except for Brazil. Portugal got Brazil. And then Portugal got some countries in Africa. You know, I mean, it's like they, the Pope decided, the Catholic Church decided, who was going to get what. Now, who gave the Pope or anybody the right to divide up anybody's land? But hey, this is our arrogance, you know? This is the way it is. And then these other businesses, these other companies, the, do you remember this from history? Some of you must have gone to, you know, ha taken some kind of American history. And there was the Dutch companies and the English companies and the French companies, and they come across the oceans. And forget about the people who lived here. They didn't count. We had the right to take everything or anything that we could see that we wanted. I mean, isn't this the kid who says, I want that. I want that. I want that toy. Yeah, that, that's my, I, you, it's your toy, not anymore. It's going to be my toy. You think I'm crazy? This is exactly the way it was, wasn't it? And then they would fight each other, you know, maybe the French and the English and but mostly, they killed off the people who were protesting. You know, the, uh, there were diseases, there was actual killing, there was uh, indentured uh, laborers, you know, kill people from overwork, kill people from a broken heart. I mean, you know, we just took, 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 took. But it didn't end there. Oh, no, because we are so entitled that we can take away from the other thieves now, I'm going to just jump a couple of hundred years, although I could talk about the slave trade, which made our wealthy people on the East Coast, the aristocracy of America, filthy, rich, slave trade. Why don't you just steal people and bring them over so that they can work on plantations and make sugar? And, you know, we had our own slavery. Plus, we had horrible working conditions for our own uh, working people. But let's skip a few hundred years, just so you start getting a sense of what this is really about. 
the Mexican-American War. You know, you guys who are always bitching and moaning about the Latinos in this country, does anybody remember that this much of our country used to be Mexico? Remember, Spain took Mexico away from the indigenous people, right? Then Mexico fought Spain and took the land away from Spain. In the early 19th century, Mexico became independent. But we took it away from them because we're entitled, because we're Americans, you know? So I have some facts here because I, I can't be expected to remember everything. So the Americans, dig this, they went to Texas, Texas, and rebelled against the authority of Mexico, even though it was Mexican. See, how would we feel if there was an enclave of Muslims in New Jersey, and they said, we are going to take this for ISIS? Well, that's what the Texans did. They rebelled against Mexico. Now, I'm not saying ISIS is good. I'm talking about us now, right? Got it? So then the U.S. annexed Texas as a state because we're America. We can do these things. And then, even though Mexico, it was Mexico. They, they still claimed it, right? So when Mexico protested, what did we do? We invaded Mexico, of course, because we're entitled. So Mexico was not ready to fight the U.S. It was, and it lost. The war resulted in Mexico's defeat. Now, dig this. You may not know this, or maybe you do. The U.S. took what is now the southwest in the U.S., including California, Nevada, and Utah. I didn't even know this. I didn't know about Utah. New Mexico and parts of Arizona, Wyoming, uh, and Colorado, as well as Texas. After all, we're America. We have a right. Then we have, later on in the century, that was 1846, in case you want to keep track. 1898, we have the Spanish-American War. Now, the, we went in ostensibly to support the Cuban Revolution, but we made out like bandits. What happened is because of the Treaty of Paris in 1898, uh, we negotiated on terms favorable to us and allowed us to gain like a protectorate over Cuba. Ever wonder why Cuba was the way Cuba was? Well, this is why, because of the Spanish-American War. We kind of treated it like a little, you know, the casino. It was the Las Vegas of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, the uh, Caribbean. And um, we also got the ownership of Puerto Rico. Did, it, did you ever wonder how we got Puerto Rico? And then we got Guam in Asia, and we got the Philippine Islands. And that was because of the Spanish-American War. And that was because we're America. We can do these things, right? We want something, we get it. Now, if you think that was the end of it, like, oh, that is so 19th century. <laughs> we don't do things like that in the 20th century. We're way too civilized. Well, let me tell you something else. Are you getting bored, or are you listening? You better be listening, because Grandma wants you to have a little history lesson today and wake up. And I'm skimming, skimming. The building of the Panama Canal. Now, that was really important because there was trade, right, through the Panama Canal. Remember, there's this thing called the Isthmus of Panama, whatever the heck an Isthmus is. And then, you know, you had the ships, they had to come through, and this and that trade, you know what I mean? We're like, we're capitalists. We are, we, money comes first. Our businesses know that the business of America is to make money for the rich people. So, anyway, the U.S., that's us, facilitated a revolt in Panama to make Panama independent, I guess it was, still under, uh, maybe it was still under Spain. And we set up the Panama Canal Zone as an American-owned and operated district. See, we just took a chunk out of somebody's country and we said, we want this because this is good for business. Did you know this? The canal opened in 1914. By the way, we didn't give it back until 1979. I remember those days. It was a big deal. So, but... It's, that wasn't enough, see, 
because now we have to protect the Panama Canal because we have business interests, right? So in order to do that, we had to several times take control of different countries because we felt threatened. So we took, we invaded Haiti several times. We took control of Nicaragua. You know, if it wasn't the United Fruit Company, we had to protect the Panama Canal. Now, does this sound like the affluenza team to you? Are you beginning to get the idea? We, the holy Christian, holier than thou, we are so good. We are going around grabbing, nabbing resources and land and killing people. And is anybody saying anything? You, I bet you didn't know at least 50% of this. Well, it's not over yet. The U.S. also sees the rise of governments in Central America that business interests, our U.S. business interests, considered a threat. And in some cases, we overthrew democratically elected governments perceived as being left-wing or, to put it another way, threatening our business interests. This is absolute truth. I will give you some examples. In 1954, which is around the corner as far as I'm concerned, there was the Guatemalan coup d'etat. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. In 1964, there was a Brazilian coup d'etat. You know, why don't we put in military governments, get rid of the democratically elected people and put in military governments that are friendly to the oligarchs. Hey, you know, there's a very rich people in these countries, and they would align with U.S. businesses, and we'd get together and we would pretend that they had a, con you know, that they had their own country and their own government. The 1973 Chilean coup d'état and the support of the Contra rebels in Nicaragua. When we overthrew these governments, they were democratically elected. We put in usually military juntas, see, that killed people, a lot of people, tortured people, but we're America. We have rights. We're entitled. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Guatemala. President Arbenz, he took office in 1951 and continued the social reform policies of his liberally social progressive predecessor. These reforms just now did this. Just to give you an idea how horrible this really is, the reforms included expanded right to vote. Oh, my God, people would have the right to vote? How dare they consider that that's their right, this in their own country. The ability of workers to organize, legitimizing political parties, and allowing public debate. Now that's downright dangerous to the American interests. And the centerpiece of what Arbenz was trying to do was agrarian reform. Now this makes me want to cry. To grant cultivable land, that means you can cultivate this land, to stricken, poverty-stricken peasants in an attempt to end the system of debt peonage, that you would have these poor peasants who were peons, that they were in debt to the landowners so they could never stop working, never get off the land, never have any rights. And Arbenz had the nerve to try to help these people, and we didn't like it. And you know why? Because of the United Fruit Company. The United Fruit Company. Have you ever heard the expression banana republic? That really referred to a number of nations, especially Central America and the northern part of South America, that were run by these fruit companies and their allies in these countries. And you say, oh my God, isn't it, aren't those terrible oligarchs in these terrible countries? But hey, we are part of why this happened, a big part. Now, you're going to love this. The United Fruit Company lobbied to have Arbenz overthrown, and he was ousted in a coup d'etat engineered by the United States Department of State under the sweet, nice, I like Ike, General Eisenhower, the hero of World War II. And this it was also engineered by the Central Intelligence Agency, along with the State Department. And it was all led by John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, who some of us will remember from history, both of whom had major interest in the United 
fruit company. Now, am I making this up? No, this is history, guys. Everybody knows this. This is not left-wing propaganda. And speaking of the U United Fruit Company, many Central American nations were labeled, you know, banana republic, as I said, because of the three major fruit companies. The fruit exporters were able to keep U.S. prices low because the banana companies, through their manipulation of the producing country's national land use laws, were able to cheaply buy large tracts of prime agricultural land for banana plantations in the Caribbean Basin and the Central American Isthmus. There's that Isthmus again. And the tropical South American countries. Having rendered the native peoples landless, are you squirming in your seat? You want to know where our money comes from? And now I'm going to give you a change of pace in case you're sick of South America, which we have always considered to be totally in our pocket. I mean, how dare Cuba have a revolution in 1959 and, and, and try to nationalize their own resources? How dare they? They're, what, 90 miles from Florida? We have a right, a right, I tell you. Well... To round this out, just in case you think this is only South America, I'm going to tell, give you an example from the Middle East. Now, the Middle East, Africa, that was mostly the colonial West. France, Belgium, England, all these empires that went in and divided up these continents for their own use and their own benefit. But we were their friends right there, right behind them. Mo Mohammed Mossadegh was an Iranian politician. Iran, you know Iran, this terrible nemesis of ours, these horrible Islamic Republic people. Mossadegh was the democratically elected prime minister of Iran from 1951 to 53. Now, what do you think happened? What, do you, do you tell me? What do you think? We overthrew him in a coup d'etat orchestrated by the American CIA and the British Secret Intelligence Service. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mossadegh. An author, administrator, lawyer, and prominent parliamentarian, his administration introduced a range of progressive social and political reforms, such as, God forbid, Social Security. Now, do you think you have a right to Social Security? Political reforms, rent control, and land reforms. Now, this is the bad, the really bad thing he did. His government's most notable policy was the nationalization of Iranian oil industry, which had been under British control since 1913. It's called imperialism. See, the British go in and they take over the oil industry of Iran, and they had the nerve to try to nationalize it. The same thing that happened in Cuba, guys. So, by the way, that British, uh, became British Petroleum. So many Iranians regard Mossadegh as the leading champion of secular democracy. We killed secular democracy in Iran, guys. And resistance to foreign domination in uh, Iran's modern history. Now, um, even though we removed Mossadegh, we continue to support the Shah of Iran, who was hated. He was a great ally of the West. And he was there until he was overthrown in 1979 by the Iranian Islamic Revolution. Are you surprised that the Iranians hate us? Wake up. Wake up, guys. We did the same thing in Vietnam. Our friend, the French, they had Vietnam as a colony. They were defeated by the Vietnamese nationalist movement, and we stepped in to take over because after World War II, the United States started to take over being the major world economic power because the darn Europeans had managed to kill each other off. Oil, fruit, land acquisition, support of our colonialist friends, imperialism, colonization. This is our history. We support Saudi Arabia which does the same thing that the Islamic State does, but they do it as the king, and they're our friends, and they go around beheading people and cutting off people's arms and throwing and flogging people for rebelling. You know, guys, 
This is entitlement. And we think nobody is ever going to reach us because, well, you know, it used to be we were far away. We had all this ocean in between us. But see, the world has changed. We have airplanes. You can go places fast. And the, the, the enemy... Now, I'm not saying the other guys are good. I'm saying there's plenty of exploitative people everywhere. And there's plenty of selfish, self-centered, monstrous people who hurt one another everywhere. But what I am saying, guys, is that when 9-11 happened, the U.S. got shook up big time. Because all of a sudden we discovered we too were vulnerable. We have become more and more vulnerable. We are not the only world powers. The Chinese, you know, are growing their economy. We don't like that. There is rebellion in the Muslim world. There's people who are fighting back against the domination of the West. And unfortunately, religion, race, nationalism, they're all mixed up, aren't they? So people who want to fight Western influence, then they hold up the banner of Islam. And then we hold up the banner of the West because we are so democratic, as you have seen. As you have seen. We are so the good guys. And so Western civilization is going to take on all of these hordes. Are you not appalled? Don't you feel sick to your stomach? Do you know that this has been done in your name, in our name? That's how we became so rich. Yes, we had a lot of resources on this land that we stole from the native peoples and from Mexico and anybody else we could steal it from. We had a lot of resources. We had a lot of hardworking people, you know. But we also stole. We have stacked the deck. When you're that rich, you go in there and you stack the deck in your favor. Now, we who are not the wealthy business owners of this world, we're sitting around... We're seeing the result of all this, and we're blaming all those other poor people for what they're doing. We blame the blacks, we blame the Hispanics, we blame the, the Syrian refugees, we blame everybody. We never look at ourselves, do we? We are the, enti- we are the affluenza teen of the world, but our day has come, and we don't like it. We can't get away with what we used to get away with. People fight back. I don't like it either. I want to feel safe and secure in this little bubble. But lying to ourselves about the cause of these problems is not going to help us because all we're doing is antagonizing more and more and more people who know what we did and who are angry at us and who are also self-centered assholes and want to feel strong and powerful and they want to be the ones who are going out taking other people's land. Like, well, why shouldn't they want that? We did. This is human nature. It's unfortunate. I don't like that about us humans. We only want for ourselves. We don't think about our accountability. We don't think about the impact of what we do to other people. Well, these people that don't like us They're making us have to think. So we have a choice, guys. We're going to go around thinking that we're entitled to be safe and secure from all the anger of all the people that we are in this power struggle with, and we are going to go down, and that's exactly what's going to happen, or we can wake up and we can understand and try to understand what motivates other people and try to work with the rest of the world. I personally would like to see everybody having a major spiritual, emotional, and heart awakening that we should all start caring about each other. Wouldn't that be nice? 2016. Don't we ha- do we have a chance? Do we have a chance to make this a different world? It starts with the heart. We have to start 
to care about one another instead of only thinking about ourselves. That means that even those lousy businesses that go offshore take with their profits so they don't have to pay taxes, or who outsource, or who leave and have eviscerated our working class, taken away the good jobs and given them to poorer people out there who don't have the right to unionize or who have no rights at all. These people have to be called to account. You know, they say that you can fool some of the people some of the time. No, you can fool some of the people all of the time. And you can fool all of the people some of the time. But you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Let's make that true. Let us wake up and begin to understand what our economic system has given birth to. This sense of entitlement to be able to grab all the resources of the planet. Let's start to become responsible. Let's start to take care of our own workers by taking care of workers overseas. Let's start caring about one another. Let's wake up. Otherwise, we're going down.